You are tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT 95.7 FM, Low Power Community Radio, Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, June 30th. We're sharing local news and resources, focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can listen anytime at kdrt.org, and I'm here live on Tuesdays. My guest today is Dr. Kuhn Van Rompe. He is a virologist at the California National Primate Research Center at UC Davis with expertise in non-human primate models of viral infections. He's worked extensively on HIV and Zika virus and is now part of a cooperative effort to develop a coronavirus vaccine. He's also the founder of Sahaya International, a Davis-based nonprofit he founded that builds awareness and support of healthcare education, environmental, and socioeconomic grassroots programs in developing countries. And I will bring you that interview in just a few minutes. You feel a sense of urgency to share as many local updates and resources as possible because the situation just keeps changing rapidly and the outlook and everything that's unknown is a source of concern for so many of us. Daily, we are bombarded with news stories about the elusive and perplexing nature of the virus, the search for a vaccine, and the economic realities of the pandemic. Just this week, Davis featured prominently in a New York Times article about the long-term economic impact the pandemic will wreak on college towns. It's not a great outlook. Over the weekend, we reached 10 million cases of coronaviruses, coronavirus, and half a million deaths worldwide. In California, the news grew increasingly dire, with nine California counties reporting a spike in new cases or hospitalizations of confirmed cases. The counties are Los Angeles, Sacramento, Fresno, Imperial, San Bernardino, San Joaquin, Tulare, Kings, and Santa Clara, and together they contain nearly half of California's population. The rising concern in California comes as 21 U.S. states reported weekly increases in new cases of COVID-19, with Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico all posting rises of 40% or higher. Close to home, Sacramento County reported 33 hospitalizations of COVID-19 patients and 14 in its intensive care units over the weekend, with public health officials attributing the rise in infections to recent gatherings, including birthday parties and a funeral, and one cluster to a single traveler who visited family in Sacramento and infected many family members. So the message here is stay home if you can. And in breaking news yesterday, bars in Sacramento County have been shut down again per county health order. According to Governor Newsom's office, new diagnoses in the heavily populated Los Angeles area are going up in part because testing is more widely available. And of course, but they also say that infections and hospitalizations in most other parts of the states are driven by factors tied directly to the loosening of restrictions or the overt flouting of public health rules. Of course, that raises fears that authorities may have to reimpose or tighten public health restrictions aimed at slowing the virus's spread. In other words, that which has been opened up may be subject to shutting down again. And looking at the bars in Sacramento, there you go. Although our numbers in Yolo County have remained low, and I'm going to talk about that more in the show, Low relative to some of these other counties, they have been trending upwards. In my recent interview with Dr. Mary Ann Limbos, the public health officer for Yolo County, she said, I really want to encourage our communities not to undo the hard work and sacrifice that residents have put in over the past few months. The biggest message I want to convey is please stay home. And when you do go out to support our local businesses, wear a face mask covering, and practice social distancing to the greatest extent possible. We've worked together this far. Let's not give up now. And finally, the COVID-19 testing site in West Sacramento has had its run extended through this Friday, July 3rd. That's free testing, and you can get more info about that and everything else related to the pandemic here in Yolo County at yolocounty.org. And we'll be back with our interview in just a minute. I first met my guest many years ago when he attended a meeting of Seroptimist International of Davis to talk about his work with Sahaya International. 
Over time, I learned about his groundbreaking work helping to develop and test the antiviral drug tenofovir used in the prevention and treatment of HIV. He is another community member we're so fortunate to have access to due to our proximity to UC Davis. He's a virologist at the California National Primate Research Center at UC Davis with expertise in non-human primate models of viral infections. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Kuhn Van Rompuy. Hi, Kuhn. How are you? Hi, good. Thank you very much for, for having me on the, um, on the show again. So yeah. Thank you. You bet. It's nice to hear from you. So one of my earlier interviews um, with Dr. Jonna Mazet, who is an epidemiologist, was about how viruses spill over from animal to human populations. As a virologist working with non-human primates, your work comes a little later in that train. Can, can you, uh, let's start with talking about what role animals play in the development of vaccines. Yes, yes, sure. So basically it has been shown uh, several months ago that uh, several animal species can also get in- infected with, with, uh, with uh, uh, the COVID-19 virus. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, there are a number of rodent models that have been developed, for example, uh, hamsters can get infected, and hamsters actually get quite sick. It was also found that if you infect macaques, mm-hmm. uh, let's say, let's say, uh, let's say a healthy uh, adult um, um, monkeys, they also get infected and they have mild symptoms. So it really resembles uh, the majority of infections in humans. Hmm. And so it, it, it has then also been shown that this is actually a very useful animal model. Uh, There are many research teams, and so we are also part of one of them, that are now using this macaque model Mm -hmm. to test interventions such as vaccines and also antiviral drugs. And so some of the data look quite promising. Uh, And, and of course, these results can actually help to push these interventions into human trials. Okay. I've read about two different... um sort of trains here. Some uh, virologists are working, uh, uh, this is to counter coronavirus, COVID-19. Some are working with compounds that have previously been approved for other uses, and while others are working with um, compounds that are have not been tested. Uh, where do you fall on that spectrum? Yeah, so right now we are actually falling in the first category mostly. So mm-hmm. because the thing is there are a number of compounds that have antiviral properties, so many of them have already been used uh, uh, against other viruses. And so, of course, for those, we have a lot of information on what's the safety, what dose should you give to animals or to humans. Yeah? So that it actually goes a lot faster if you can take something off the shelf of which, of which mm-hmm. you already have, uh, have some background data instead of starting f- from the scratch board, yeah, where you really have to first figure out, look, what dose would you use to give sufficient levels in the body, and also then whether that dose is, re- is really safe or not. Yeah. So one phrase we hear a lot these days is when we have a vaccine or when a vaccine is developed, but I, I get the sense that that process can take an awfully long time. Can you tell us a bit more about where you start and where you hope to end up in developing a vaccine? Yeah, so basically the development of a vaccine uh, is really uh, very time-consuming yeah? because, of course, you really want to make sure that the vaccine works. But uh, also, uh, let's say, above all, you want the vaccine to be safe. Mm-hmm. And so with uh, some other viruses, sometimes there have been vaccines that were developed that looked promising early on, but then when they were actually rolled out on massive scale, it was discovered that some of those vaccines actually had serious side effects. So that uh, sometimes, for example, uh, that, that happened with the vaccine against the dengue virus, mm-hmm. that subpopulations of people actually became more susceptible if they had first received the vaccine. Oh. So, that, so that's actually a very big risk. Eh? So that's something that really has to be then beat. Uh, so, that, so that's why the whole process of vaccine development is quite slow. Mm-hmm. We, are, we are now also gearing up to become part of a large network of different private centers where we are actually going to test several vaccines that are now already in human trials. Uh, and so that look promising so far, really do a head-to-head comparison in monkeys yeah, with regard to the efficacy and regard to safety. So that if, for example, it's seen in humans that each of these vaccines seems to kind of work, the monkey data can actually then help us to tell us, look, which vaccine of all of those seems to be the most effective one. Mm-hmm. But also one of the big questions with vaccines is also uh, when you, 
people or also animals are vaccinated, how long does it give protection? Yeah? Because, of course, ideally we want a vaccine that if somebody gets immunized, they would be protected for at least several years and hopefully for many years. Right. And there's, you know, a lot of us are reading a lot of different things, but not all, all of us are virologists, which is why I'm so glad to have you here. But uh, I read over the weekend, the Washington Post wrote an article about the G variant in COVID-19. Essentially, there's uh, already this virus is mutating. So what do such mutations mean for vaccine development? Yes, yeah, so that's something that's a very good question. So the virus is slowly mutating, and so people are now trying to figure out, does that really affect how the virus behaves? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So far, it seems that the mutations that have been discovered don't seem to uh, be in regions that would affect the efficacy of, the vac- of, most, of the, most of the vaccines that are right now uh, be, uh, being developed. So that's at least kind of promising. Mm-hmm. But it's really something that we really need to be uh, see, uh, keeping a very close eye on. Yeah? So how does the virus mutate and how do those mutations kind of map compared to what are your targets for your vaccines? Yeah. Right. Something else I'm curious about, there are a lot of coronaviruses. You know, COVID-19 is the one that has caught our attention this year. But have you actually worked on vaccine development for any of the others? Has that been part of your work? Uh, no, so far my vaccine development has mostly been on HIV mm-hmm. and Zika virus. So I have never really worked on developing vaccines against coronavirus. I know there is a lot of interest because, of course, as you mentioned, there are many different coronaviruses. Mm-hmm. Uh, some uh, some companies are actually working on trying to develop kind of a, uh, what they call a pan-coronavirus vaccine, mm-hmm. trying to identify regions that are very common among the different uh, coronaviruses so that hopefully you can have one vaccine that may give protection against all of them so that mm-hmm. we would hopefully be better prepared uh, against future outbreaks. Yeah, talk about a rapidly evolving field. Um, y- 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 I imagine that you were kind of thrown into this a, a few months ago when, when everything started and you shifted your work. Is that true? Yes, that's true. Basically, six months ago, uh, I mean, you would hear on the news very briefly uh, uh, about outbreaks in China. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, of course, when uh, early, uh, let's see, early this year, it really spread across the globe. All of a sudden, we got kind of thrown in, uh, yeah, thrown into this. Most of us kind of stopped most of our other research. Yeah, uh, of course, we use the expertise, the background we have, the teams that we had to work on HIV. Yeah. And many of, of those teams have now really changed the focus of the laboratories to work on this new coronavirus. I think your field of virology is going to be the field in in this century and moving forward because, you know, again, from what I'm reading, there's COVID-19, but there may be other viruses around the corner and things we we can't even fathom yet. I don't want to scare yeah, yeah. people, but I think that's true, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, of course, what we're also le- learning from this, I mean, the basic knowledge that we get from here, I mean, from uh, studying this current coronavirus will also help us to really attack future epidemics a lot more. And I think it also highlights that we really need to invest more. Yeah? We really need to invest more in research facilities, uh, train uh, I mean, many, uh, many more young, young investigators to really encourage them to enter this research field yeah? Yeah. so that we would really be much, much better um, um, prepared for the next outbreak. We're going to need them, that's for sure. Well, on on the topic of young folks, let me use that as a jumping off point so we can switch gears and talk about Sahaya International, which I I think is your, you sound pretty passionate about your uh, work as a virologist, but I think Sahaya International is is your true passion project. Uh, Please tell us about this nonprofit you founded. Yes, basically I founded this nonprofit about 20 years ago. So, um, uh, I never really imagined myself starting any charity work, but then uh, in 1997, I was invited to present some of my uh, HIV research at a conference in South India. And mm-hmm. so there I was as a researcher uh, trying to deal with the HIV epidemic. And But yet when I saw people living on the street in Chennai, I was very, uh, say very depressed because I thought, look, these people have so, so many issues. And I decided to do something. I met a social worker there. Mm-hmm. He, he kind of inspired me, and then slowly, thanks to the help of friends here in Davis, I decided to start my own charity. And so we have been growing over the past 20 years. Even though our uh, big focus is still the say, several programs uh, in South India, over the years we've also been able to expand our programs to Kenya, Vietnam, Philippines, Uganda. And so we are, we are all volunteer-based. We're really a large network of friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's say we are almost, let's say, family, helping to raise money, uh, making a difference. 
So tell us about the kinds of work you're supporting in these countries. And I'm just going to read them off again because I pulled this from your website. Uh, India, Vietnam, Philippines, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Yeah, yeah, so one of the largest programs that we have in almost all of those countries is we help uh, needy children and orphans. So we link uh, sponsors here in the U.S. and in Europe with children in India, Vietnam, and Kenya. And so uh, sponsors here provide some monthly support, and in return they, they, they then receive a letter and lots of photographs. Mm-hmm. And so that's actually been very rewarding because we started this program in India about, uh, about 20 years ago. So several of the kids that I met during my first trips there to, uh, t- to India are now uh, actually becoming, uh, say, um, are now adults. So many of them have completed their schooling. Many of them have finished college. They are working. So it's actually been very rewarding, yeah? especially if you consider a number of those children, when I met them, they were sick because of HIV. But we were able to uh, get them sent to a local HIV clinic. We were put them on HIV medicines. Mm-hmm. And right now, those, uh, these children have grown up. They are adults. They are productive. Several of them got married, have children who are healthy. Yeah? And so it's been really very rewarding that we can give people who are in dire need a much better future. Yeah. And you're very personally vested in this work. Obviously, on Facebook, you refer to many of these folks as your sons and daughters. Yeah, Yeah, exactly, because I have known so many of them over the years. And so, of course, many of these children have lost both parents. And so they cannot see me as either a father or uncle. And so, uh, yeah, I actually communicate with them very much because many of them uh, also... Uh, are are active on like WhatsApp, and so almost every day I get messages from them, yeah, and so it's actually for me very rewarding. I feel I have this family across the globe. Yeah. Yeah. So and so sometimes even when, for example, in research there are always good days and bad days where sometimes you wonder, yeah, uh, let's say I'm not able to make much much progress in my research or so. Mm-hmm. But then I always think, uh, yeah, at least we're able to make make a difference. I think even if you can make a difference in the life of one child. That's more than worth it. Yeah, can you share um, a success story? You know, one of the kids who's who you watched grown up and has gone on to l- live their life and do good things. Uh, yeah, for example, one of the children that's very close to my heart is uh, Monisha. I met her when she was five years old. Uh, so she has HIV. Uh, both uh, both her parents had died. She was raised by her grandparents, and mm-hmm. so her future looked very bleak, especially when her grandfather passed away. But then I was able to link her to one of my friends here in Davis, and uh, uh, my friends were able to provide some monthly support to her. So we were able to get Monisha, Monisha started on HIV medicines. So she was able to become more healthy. She was able to get through school. Because, of course, of a, uh, of a HIV condition, she had to travel to the clinic every month. Mm-hmm. So that somehow inspired her. So when she finished high school, she decided to uh, start nursing school. And so she finished nursing school about two years ago, and right now she's working as a nurse for our partner, uh, say our partner organization in South India. Hmm. So she really uh, helps the school children. She helps the other HIV-infected children with a uh, with a simple, uh, say, physical checkups. She also helps with a network that we have created for HIV-positive children. So in addition to giving them uh, medical support, she also gives them uh, counseling. Uh, she does, I'll uh, say, fun, fun, creative activities with them. Yeah? Because I think giving children a future is more than just the physical things, giving them food, sending, sending them to school. You also have to give these children hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're investing in them as fellow human beings. You know, they're not yes, yeah. they're not just a someone living in another country who needs help. Hmm. That's wonderful. That's what they call a full circle story where, yeah, yeah, exactly. you know, you can put, give your input and, and make a difference and see it come to fruition. That's wonderful. So I also wanted to ask you how the, how the pandemic is affecting Sahaya's work, because for example, I know that you usually have a big event uh, every October yeah. and it's very hard to plan for events and things right now. So how are you, how are you getting yeah. the word out? Yeah, exactly. So, of course, uh, we are still planning our event in October, but then instead of making it a real event, we're going to see if we can do something online, yeah, so where we can really perhaps have several people who uh, say who, uh, who are presenting some of the work that, uh, that uh, we are doing. Mm-hmm. I'm also, of course, very, very active on social media, so I keep posting stories from India, Kenya, let's say our other partners there, mm-hmm. to really make uh, say people feel connected. 
in uh, in the countries where we are active, many of these countries are also still under lockdown. Yes, yeah? so the situation yes. is actually becoming very dire. People don't have jobs. Often people cannot really travel. So um, we're grateful that a number of my friends, especially here in Davis, have already been able to step up their support so that we can actually send some extra money to the partner organizations there, and they are able to provide the basic necessities, such as some extra food and clothing, to the people who are the most in need. Yeah? And so that's why I'm very grateful that people haven't really given up, mm -hmm. that there are many good people here in this world who, even when times are challenging here for us in the U.S., who still keep their heart open. Yeah? So that, 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 that's actually, for me, very uh, heartwarming and something that really inspires me. I, I'm glad that you're able to feel that and experience that. I've I've had the experience too during the pandemic of, you know, there are a lot of people who were on the edge, who are going over the edge, and there's a lot that's wrong. But I've also seen just incredible kindness bubbling up to the surface and people wanting to be connected. Yeah, exactly. So I think especially during these difficult times, uh, I think we see that many people even step beyond yeah, and really realize, look, we are in this together. Yeah? Things that happen in other parts of the world also really affect what, uh, say, the things here. Yeah? Uh, and so that's, I think, uh, something that I really hope that will come out of this epidemic, that once we have a vaccine, once we have a good treatment, that we will be able to come out of this epidemic in a stronger way and with a more global sense of, look, we are all interconnected. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We really have to help each other. We live on this very same planet. Right. We can also work together to tackle other issues, such as global warming. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, if nothing else, a, a tiny virus has illustrated how connected we all are. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's make sure we give people a place where they can get more information about the work you do with Sahaya International. Yeah, yeah, so basically people can go to our website. So it's www.sahaya, and Sahaya is spelled S-A-H-A-Y-A dot O-R-G. Mm -hmm. And so people there uh, say can also uh, easy, uh, say easily find my, uh, say my personal contact information. So I would be more than happy to, uh, to talk to them directly. Right. I, I also imagine, I know you travel a lot and, and generally um, for Sahaya and for your work, and I'm imagining that you're, you're pretty grounded right now and here at UC Davis, which is why I had an opportunity to talk to you today. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I want to thank you for your time and uh, thank you for the work you're doing. It's, it's, it's really important. I know that, um, you know, for some people talking about um, medical research done on animals is, is challenging, but you, I know in all your materials, you make it really clear that it's, it's essential if we are to develop vaccines and such. So. Sure. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much. Take good care. Right. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. That was Dr. Kuhn Van Rompe, a virologist at the UC Davis uh, National Research Primate Center and uh, head of Sahaya International. I'm going to repeat uh, the URL for that website again. It's sahaya.org, S-A-H-A-Y-A. -A. I'm going to take uh, just a minute or two for music here, and I'll be back with my wrap-up. Okay, we have a few minutes left. And I'm going to end by with a big quote that I saw on Yolo County Supervisor Don Saylor's Facebook page. And he wrote this last night, and these are important words to hear right now. COVID-19 is alive and spreading in Yolo County. Our case count has doubled in the past two weeks. Each day at about 5 p.m., the Yolo County COVID-19 dashboard is updated to display the number of people who have tested positive for the virus and other key indicators. For the past several weeks, we've experienced a disturbing increase in the number of COVID cases. As of last night, June 29th, Don wrote the dashboard rep reports a total of 505 COVID-19 cases in Yolo County, which is an increase of 26 new cases over the day before. And we've been seeing a lot of that the last couple weeks, big jumps almost daily. Of the 505 cases, 251, or about half, were identified within the past 14 days. A common public health tracking concept is the rate of cases per 100,000 population. 
Yellow County has 220,000 people and 505 cases as of June 29th. So our rate of positive cases per 100,000 people is 229. And according to the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, on June 29th, the rate of cases per 100,000 population for California is 534, and for the United States as a whole is 777. Don continues, the Yolo County coronavirus dashboard displays the distribution of Yolo County COVID cases within the cities and unincorporated areas of the county. Here are the cases per 100,000 by jurisdiction as of June 29th. Winters, 386. Woodland, 358. West Sacramento, 312. Unincorporated areas, 97. And Davis, 73. Don concludes, Independence Day is just around the corner. Many of the new cases identified over the past few weeks have been tracked to social gatherings around Memorial Day, graduations, and other large group gatherings. For our own safety and for those around us, it remains critical for all of us to continue safe practices outlined in guidance documents issued by the state and Yolo County. And I know I sound like, this is me, Autumn now, I sound like a broken record, but frequent hand washing, sanitizing, physical distance, and face coverings. Don notes, we are in this together. And you can reach him at don.sailor, S-A-Y-L-O-R, at yellowcounty.org, and he holds regular office hours on Zoom. I am going to wrap up here for today. I thank you for tuning in, and I thank you for your support of local community radio. From the KDRT studio, I'm Autumn Labbe-Renault, and this has been the COVID-19 Community Report.